Welcome to our latest rebroadcast, podcast number 81. Let's evaluate who and what you have been following, featuring Mike from COT. This episode originally aired on May 29, 2024, exclusively on counciloftime.com. For more details, check the link in the description below. Join Michael from Council of Time as we explore eschatology and navigate today's challenges in this captivating episode number 81. Let's evaluate who and what you have been following. To gain deeper insights, visit the Council of Time's official website linked below. We're dedicated to providing truth, hope, and support to those struggling with addiction and seeking the Most High's guidance. Your support helps us guide individuals towards truth, sobriety, and preparedness for the perilous times foretold in scripture. Join our exclusive Locals community for EGP family members and enjoy early access to exciting content. Thank you for being an integral part of the End Generation Project's success. Before getting into today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 81, titled, Let's Evaluate Who and What You Have Been Following, we're thrilled to introduce our brand new merchandise line. Our selection includes high quality t-shirts, mugs, and bags, each designed to inspire and remind you of your faith journey. Every purchase directly supports the operation of this channel, helping us to continue creating valuable content and providing guidance. Soon we will have a live store right here on our YouTube channel. Stay tuned for some real exciting updates coming tomorrow. Your purchases are essential to our mission. They enable us to reach a wider audience, provide more insightful episodes, and grow our outreach. When you shop with us, you're not just buying great products, you're making a significant impact on our community. Explore our collection and help sustain our efforts by visiting our store today. Thank you for your ongoing support and generosity. May the Lord your God keep you all, always. Blessings. Okay, everybody. God bless you out there. Finally made it. Hopefully everybody is uh, doing okay. Yes, we have a big eruption. Nice. We're going to go over Iceland, the dynamics of Iceland. Probably this weekend. I have to get some graphics together for that. I say that because Iceland is the last, and some people, they do remember, a, a brief conversation. We had it was a long time ago. What year was that? Anybody remember? And now we're back at it again. As I was saying before the computer just uh, shut down, right? It's just one of them. I have to keep Mixler isolated on a separate system, totally total separate system. It is third party software. So it's on a it's on a system isolated from the network and everything else. I have to do that because Mixler, uh, there are people exploiting your services, and I don't really trust that. Okay, just so you know that. I don't want that on any machine uh, that will, um, no no machine that will, you know, cause any, cause an issue. Now, this unbalanced thing that I'm perceiving, zero is good, but for some reason, the balance issue is on the, because of what? Why do we have an imbalance on audio input? That seems a bit uh, odd. Can you guys say? I do not like imperfections, especially in things that are made by people, right? I don't really like that. And I can already see. Uh, yeah, that's what I get for refurbing things, right? Don't refurb if you don't have to. Don't do that. I can reset this filter and gain here. I do believe I have that coupled, don't I? Right. In the left coupled, I want to reset these and gain filters so we have a different uh, thing. Okay, guys, if you can tolerate this, I'm going to get this worked out after. 
after I go through everything, I'm going to have to get this worked out because this is absolutely 100% ridiculous. It is. It's kind of lopsided. Lopsided signal means bad wire. So I have to find that. That means I have to clean. It's time to clean all the contacts. If you if you do have anything like a you know studio and wires and things of that nature, right? Uh, there's a special lubricant that I use, and it will last for about three years, right? You clean your 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 uh, uh, plugs, your stereo plugs, things like that. Every three years, it is perfect. Moisture can't get to it, especially when you're in a high humidity environment, which we had a couple times. But it does a really good job, and I'll show you guys that too. All right. It is a dielectric, actually, but it's from a specific uh, manufacturer that does a really good job. So you put that on there, and it distributes like uh, I like olive oil, right? If you take one drop of olive oil on a still lake, do you guys know that that olive oil will cover the entire lake one molecule thick? Did you guys know that? Isn't that something? Hmm. Please use the other one. Okay, I'll do that, Mayor. Listen, also, also, guys, listen. Uh, America is compromised uh, in a big way. Listen, we're going to go ahead and have this discussion. It's going to be a bit different, but I want you guys prepared. So we're going to talk about certain preparations. But you have to have the truth on this. And right? now, as I explained before, I was in a chat room earlier, right? And somebody was talking about, for example, Israel. Uh, I, I, I don't remember the complete comment, but it was a good one. And they said that, um, that you know, things are withdrawn from Israel, right? Somebody said, why does the Midden News say no? Say so many hateful things against Israel, basically stating Israel is in the wrong with everything they do. I, you know, in... in I've heard two of his comments, and hear me out on this. Hear me out on this. He's talking about the individuals. Right? He's not talking about the whole everybody there. It's not what he's talking about. He's talking about individuals who do specific things. So you have to, listen, you have to have things in context. When you're hearing someone. Try not to lock in to the offensive things. Don't do that. Don't lock into the offensive things. Because if anybody does that with me, which they have done in the past, um, they're, they're liable to hear anything. They'll take it wrong. You have people and leadership in Israel that are absolute devils. Okay? They're devils. They're in leadership. They're devils. I'll tell you that right now. He likely knows exactly who they are. They are devils, and they shouldn't be there. That's why in the Bible, right, it, it, when, when, when a letter was given to the certain churches, it says, I know you're around those who say they are Jews but are not, but they are the synagogue of Satan, right? So what that means is you have folks in that land who pretend to be Jews, right? They, their DNA may say they're Jews, but in their souls— they're the devil, right? They, these people are devilish. They are, they are just not what you think, okay? Um, but someone had a question for me in the chat room, and they said, why does the USA, you know, um, certain things are happening within the USA, and they said, well, maybe it's a consequence of withdrawing support from Israel. And I say, you've got to be careful with that, right? Just this morning, a ship was dispatched, to Israel full of supplies that was going to Israel. Um, in fact, we've never stopped supporting Israel. We've never. Now, this is where you have to be careful because we know we are in a political season. We know that the media, right, based on if they're Democrat or Republican, they're going to they're gonna have that news or whatever information they have, is gonna, they're going to use it for propaganda to support or to go against certain ideologies, right? This is in, in any time when you're inside of an election year. Every single time it happens, people start hearing all sorts of things on the news, and it never matches up with reality. Never. It never does. And then after the election, when things calm down, right, about the first uh, four months into an election, things calm down, 
all of a sudden everything is back to normal. They begin to report back on past events, and they never line up to the rhetoric they were spewing during the election year. So be careful of that. You have ambitious people who support their political side, and they will say whatever they can say against the opposite side. Okay, so remember that. It's very important that we kind of, especially during an election year, to not lock on to what the media is saying. But I do understand that all people have, see, all this news is coming through media, period. It's coming through media. So it's ironic, but this is what people do. They don't like the media, but they get their information from the media. And then they report on what the media reported on, and they have an opinion about that. But the source of their information is from the very people they don't trust. Okay? So that's what you have to watch, right? I remember not more, not five years ago um, on a couple of delegations going into Israel, talking to counterparts uh, a lot. You know, support for Israel is very consistent and constant. It's impossible. Listen to me carefully. It's impossible that we're not in support of Israel. The day we stop supporting Israel is the day they fall. Do you know that? We are locked in. Our systems are locked in that close that the USA and Israel are essentially one and the same. Right? The only way to get to Israel like that is to take down our military. There are some things about Israel. There are some... Uh, there are some hard stations in Israel that, that civilians don't know about, right? Uh, certain military personnel do not know about. Um, there are relationships, military relationships, um, supply roles, combat roles that are being performed that operate in Israel is instrumental in it. And so is USA. So they talk every single day, every single day they talk. What you hear on the news what you hear on the news is it's part true, but a lot of it is biased. It is. A lot of it is biased. You have to remember that. Okay? Remember that. Because we don't want to get locked into bias, right? We don't want to get locked into somebody's ideology, which is why nothing ever pans out when it comes to the end result of these news stories that you guys hear about. So be careful, especially, be careful with that, right? From the election, uh, these elections that are happening, from the reports on Trump, be careful about that. Be careful about any reports on Biden. One thing we know for sure is that I, I can guarantee you, I can give you this personal guarantee, people are going to back away from certain news stories in, in a hurry because of the real consequences that could be faced by covering certain stories. For example, if people start dying in leadership, right, nobody's going to want to talk about that. When they start cutting accounts and prosecuting civilians for inciting violence that led to the death of major figures, people are going to start backing off because, see, then it's not going to be playtime. It's going to be real consequences, real consequences. Now, the Father tells us to be holy in all manner of communication. If we could just obey that, we'd be fine. Because in the Bible it says that Jesus, the Holy Spirit will give us words that nobody can gainsay against. Do you know that? That's what the Holy Ghost does. All right? Please remember that. And somebody asked me a major question today. They were talking about the elections. They were talking about Biden. They were talking about Trump. And it was a very deep conversation. And things began to come forward. In my response to a few things, and this guy said, well, well, God selects leaders. We know that by Daniel. I said, yes. But when you read the whole Bible, you understand that man threw that away right after Daniel. And God took note of it and sent a prophet to speak about it. Something that's highly relevant today, something we're going to put in context today so that you guys know it too, because you guys have heard that too. When we studied the book of Daniel, it is God who selects the kings, right? He puts kings in power. Isn't that correct? Isn't that what the Bible says? That's what the Bible says, right? God appoints kings. How many understand that? How many know that? 
that God appoints kings. How many understand that? So what happens in a rebellious nation? Hmm? What happens in an entire nation is rebellious. Anybody? Anybody? Anybody know what, what happens in that case? When you have a rebellious nation, they turn against the advisements of the living God. See, that's what a lot of people think, an evil king. Oh, we're going to get the, we're going to get the word word. See, this is where the word is very important. This is where the word is critical. So let me, let me stop everybody first. No, it does not mean you get an evil king. That's not what it means. If a nation is corrupt, then the people are going to select everything they select is going to be corrupt. Everything they do is going to be corrupt. Let me, let me, let me give it to you this far. If a nation turns against the living God, and how do you know a person is in servitude to the living God? The Lord said their speech and their love for one another. Let me give you an example of that. There have been plenty of times that even I, in a promotion, it is very competitive, and you have others who compete against you, right? You're all, you're all striving for the same position. Not one time did I ever say anything negative against my opponents. But do you not know that the other side would often, people use some very bad tactics, and sometimes they try to sway the selection committee, and they will say bad things. I, ref- I, I don't do that. I never did that. If I speak about anybody, right, if it does not help the individual, I will hold my tongue. If I cannot help a person, I have nothing to say about the person. Nothing. Nothing at all. That's partly the reason why people are going to be walking around powerless in a time where they need the power of the Holy Spirit to continue to walk. But because they chose the, uh, a different way, they have to deal with consequences of being powerless that way. I still have a hope that many can correct it, but that's something every person must come to terms for himself. Anyway, when you're in competition, you speak evil of your opponent, right? Then you're already in to find some of the living God. See, God told us not, not to focus and cast down the enemy and do all this and talk talk all this stuff about it. He told us not to do that, but to lift up his name, his standards, to represent his way, even in the face of opposition, to stand up in righteousness, right? Hmm? I'm telling you right now, there, there are, I, I'd say, a handful of leaders that are learning this lesson right now. They're learning it. They do not have to say a negative thing about their opponent. All they have to do, is stand up where they are. Stand up with integrity. Stand up with truth. And take the responsibility. That's all they have to do. They don't have to speak one word against their opponent. Do you know why? Because when you don't speak evil against somebody who's against you, do you know what the people around you begin to do? They start defending you. That's what they do. They start defending you. They did Jesus the same way. They wanted to kill Jesus in the streets so many times, but they couldn't do it because of the people. I've told you guys lots of times here in COT, I said, listen, don't defend me, right? Because you guys have never, never, I never came to the microphone and threw somebody under the bus. I never did that. And I'd ask, you remember I requested of you guys, don't defend me? But guess what happened? You know how many people you ran off? from doing bad things. You did. You did. And it's not that you knew who you were running off. That's not what it was. It's because you maintained a standard. When you maintain a standard, there are certain laws that affect upon your life, like sowing and reaping. If you don't sow something, how can you reap it? And if you do reap something you did not sow, someone is going to pay for that. And I mean, it's going to be immediate. In so doing, by holding your tongue, you defeat your enemy. Now, you see how that wisdom is different from worldly wisdom. You see that? Do you see that? 
all as a human being, all we know is to, you know, you get kill another person. They're no longer, you know, against you, wrong. Because if you get rid of one, seven more rise up in its place. They haven't caught on to that. They haven't caught on to that. But when you lift up the standards to the most high, because your children are the kingdom, you're not just a person in the world. And when you lift up his standards and you speak for his value system, the Lord's value system, and you take a step forward in faith and you continue, regardless of what anybody is saying, people become your defense. They will put a hinge around you. You need not say anything to your enemy or anything. You need not say that. Because what the Lord say? The Lord said he would fight your battles. And I'll tell you something. That's what your enemy would be so scared of. When the Lord himself handles the opposition against you. When the Lord himself handles it. See, because so long as you handle it, the Lord will not touch you. Do you know that? He will not. That's why people do not experience Full deliverance in the Lord because they have their hands in so much. So long as you're doing something, the Lord's not going to interfere with it. He gives us the power of choice. And if you choose to to dabble in something, to be your own defense, he will not step in. He won't defend you. You're going to have to eat crow and whatever you're doing. But if you follow his way, he He will come up against your enemy. He will do it. You see that? See, in the Bible it says, the enemy will come at you one way. See, but if if if, if you are standing within the kingdom of God, the enemy will flee from you several ways. You know, I've seen that happen. I cannot explain, but I do pray for my enemies. I told you guys a story one time. I hope for the best for so many people. I do. I do. And it's not that I'm squeaky clean, right? I'm a sinner saved by grace. But you have people that are sometimes mean. And when you're in college and people have that college mentality when they're, you know, early in college and you're a a butter bar or something like that, you don't really gain respect from your peers. You don't. And they do. Sometimes they can go overboard, especially when they have some courage juice in them, which is alcohol. Right. So this one group, for no reason, they were just, you know, started hurling insults. I didn't say a word, but I did pray for them. In that moment, I felt sorry for them, all three of them. And I began to pray for them. And then people noticed what they said. They didn't really like it either. I didn't say a word, right? I didn't say a word. Now, what makes it funny is I was much bigger than they were. I didn't say a word. I didn't. I maintained my peace, and I actually prayed for them. I did. Because in that moment, it's almost like the Lord opened up my mind, and the Lord said, they have no idea what they're doing. Because you sought no instant vengeance by responding. My laws are in effect. I pray for them, and that night, do you not know that night all three were in critical condition? Critical condition. Do you know that happened again? And it happened again. And it happened again. And it happened again. And it keeps happening to this day. When somebody wrongs you, right? But you choose the way of your father. If you choose your father, You're going to do nothing but love your fellow man, period. You cannot hate your your fellow man. You choose the living God. Do you know why? Because God sent his son to die for the people who do those bad things against you. Oops, that's right. Jesus came to save the lost. He didn't come to save the found. Hmm? Somebody said, Mike, sounds like you cursed them. No, I did not. God's laws are in effect. If you do stuck against the just, the Lord will fight your battles. You need not lift a finger. In fact, in the Bible, it says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. In fact, it says, do not touch vengeance. Don't let your mind enter into that arena. Don't think about it. Don't enter into it. Do not exact anything upon your enemy. 
You love your enemy. You overcome evil with love. You overcome those things with love. Now, how do you do that? How do you love somebody who does that? You have to know who your father is first. There are lots of people they know of God. They don't know God. They know of Christ. They don't know Christ. Because if they knew Christ, they would know why he came back. Those same people who hurled those insults were no different than me. See, in anybody who would ever wrong me, I can always see myself in them. That's what you may not know. To my worst enemies out there, I can see myself in them. The Lord has simply washed me of certain things. It does not mean I'm innocent of them. Not one of us is innocent. If we were innocent, we would not be here. We're not innocent. We're guilty. So for me to exact anything upon my enemy is to condemn myself. If I ever do that, I'm a hypocrite. The Lord saved me from the violence I did against his law. From the sin I chose to enter into against him. I didn't accidentally sin. I chose it. So how can I come against an enemy who simply sins against me, but I did the same thing to everybody else at some point in time? No, I will not touch vengeance. That is the law. I don't need to know the details. I seek to obey the living God because I believe in him, and that's a difference. When you believe in the living God, you don't need to know why. You just need to know he said it. Hmm? That's what happens when you believe in someone. When you believe in someone, you trust them. You don't believe in anybody you don't trust. If you don't trust them, you're going to say, well, why? Why do that? Why do this? Why do that? Why do that? Why do that? When you trust someone, you become like a child, and you simply say yes. You don't need to know why. See, I know when all this is over. When you're in the realm of truth and love and all wisdom, you won't have questions. You won't have that. If your life has not been adjusted to where you have gotten away from all those things, then it means your way is not working. You might want to try the Lord's way. In fact, you might want to choose the Lord's way. So what you have to do is find his standards and what he expects of you and live by them as best you can. Live by them as best you can. Remind yourself of his standards as much as you can and live by them. And then you will see the salvation of the Lord, the Bible says. Then you will see the salvation of the Lord. Then you will see the salvation of the... How many want to see the salvation of the Lord? Not just know about it, but see it. How many want to see it? Because if you see it, it's going to be in your situation. That's when your enemies, they start falling by the wayside or they are converted How many want to see that? How many want to see the transition of your enemy to the one who protects you with their life? How many want to see that? Hmm? That's my world. But it can be yours too. That's part of the kingdom. Not this flesh stuff. I'm telling you right now, to love your enemy is simply to love yourself. Do you know that? Because your enemy is the same as you. If a person hurt someone physically and another person discouraged a person, who did the worst thing? The one who physically hurt a person or the one who discouraged a person? Who did the worst thing? Who did did the worst thing? Which one is worse? To discourage someone or to physically hurt someone? Which one is worse? Come on, somebody. Which one is worse? Somebody tell me. Somebody tell me. And then tell me why. Can somebody tell me why? Why do you choose what you choose? Somebody said sin is sin. I agree. Absolutely. 
But one is worse than the other. But do you know how? Somebody said discourage hurts the heart. Well, so does so does physical. You know, physical hurt does the same thing. But here's the difference. You ready? When you hurt someone, they can physically heal from that as though nobody ever hurt them at all and walk out their lives forgetting that you ever hurt them in the first place physically, right? When you discourage someone, you can murder that generation and future generations. See, if you get, here's why murder is so bad. You don't just kill the one person. You kill an entire generation that would come from that person. So you're not just a killer of one person. You just killed everything down that path of that person. You killed an entire future. Hmm? That's what you did. That's what happens. That's why the Lord said, what did the Lord say? If you hate your enemy, you're a murderer. And the love of God is not in you. You are a murderer if you hate. Your neighbor is everyone but you. If you hate your enemy, you become a murderer, and you do, in fact, attract a murderous spirit. And it will not leave you alone. It must be purged. Why do you think anger does not go anywhere? Why do you think frustration doesn't go anywhere? Why do you think your irritation level hits maximum when you hear specific things? That's a murderous spirit attached. And let me tell you something about that murderous spirit. It does not surface all that. You can go all your life and it will never surface. It only takes that one time to corrupt the totality of your life. That means it could lie dormant within you all your life and rear its head when it really counts. That's what that means. Back to the leaders. Yes, we did have a conversation about Biden and Trump. Some of us men in a very deep conversation. But see, the same thing applies. Now, people can call Biden a warlock, which whatever the case is, right? I'll tell you something. Unless I have seen the person engage in activities, I can't make certain calls. I can't do that. I must see the person engaged in activities. I must see it. It must be confirmed within me, or I cannot sit there and call somebody something that they're not. That's gossip, and I don't like gossip. I don't do gossip, right? I don't do that. But they were talking about Biden, and and somewhat of an argument broke out between two gentlemen because of the term... God appoints kings, right? That was the term. And the one individual said, or was conveying, that we all, all of us do this, that when the person we like is in power, all of a sudden we say God did it. But when the person we don't like is in power, all of a sudden we say the devil's doing it. And how do we get away from that? How do we bring that into the light so that people can see what Satan is causing through them. How do we get them into the light? Well, my answer was, we have to learn to operate in truth. To operate in truth is this. I cannot tell you anything about your life unless God discloses your life to me. I cannot tell you anything about your life. Whether you're good or bad is irrelevant. I cannot tell you anything about your life. I have no experience with you in your life. And I'm not willing to take the chance in condemning anybody. Because if I condemn one person, I know the Lord will condemn me. Now, I'm not doing that. I can see the truth of that, the necessity of that. But you have a lot of folks who will speak what they think and then spread it. They end up doing what the Lord hates, which is called tail-bearing. That means you hear something, you hear some information, then you take that information as though you have experience with it, and you begin to distribute that. The Lord
Lord does not like that. That's tail-bearing. That's the murder of nations. It is. Anyway, but the question was, how do, we, how do you move away from that, right? How do we bring that to light so that people can really understand it, so that they can see it and recognize it? And it really takes us operating in truth. See, here's a here's the truth. You ready? All of us here, do we really operate in truth? Do we still talk about subjects we know we have no experience with? Why are we so trusting of somebody else's information? And yet we question the living God about the simplest of things. Yet we can cast somebody down on the credibility of a human being. Not self-observation or direct observation, but by the word of another human being, we will cast another human being down to the ground. Then when it comes to the word of God, we're full of questions. We'll accept the information. So much so we'll act on it as though it's true. Full faith in that information. But when it comes to the word of God, we can't move unless we have more information. If we operated in truth, how could we talk about anybody we didn't know personally? We couldn't, could we? You'd have zero Christians talking about political figures because they don't know them. Think about that. You guys remember the challenge I had for you guys in COT, and it was this. If you have no personal knowledge of something, don't even mention it. Now, personal knowledge is that personal experience. It means you have direct knowledge. You have worked with it. You know it inside and out. That went with people. And so my point was this, that if you don't know a person in truth, and they, I mean precisely, right, which means you have no experience with that person, then don't talk about that person outside of that person. Some people found that almost impossible to do. A lot of people said as soon as they, as soon as that broadcast ended through their social media or through friends, whatever the case was, other people started popping up. It was like everybody wanted them to talk about somebody else, to make a comment on somebody else, but they couldn't say anything because they did not know the person. It was actually quite beautiful because it brought the light in those people's lives that they were talking about people they had no experience with. It's kind of like correcting a person, right? People love to correct people. But I live by this one thing. If you don't really love a person, I mean really love them, which means you'll lay down your life for that person, which means you don't ever want that person embarrassed, which means you don't ever want that person to lose, which means you don't ever want that person hurt. When you really do love a person, that's when you can correct a person. You cannot correct anybody you do not have genuine love for. In the word of God, that's always established first. Then the correction comes. If you're not in relationship with a person, you have no business correcting them. Correcting someone is an act of love and mercy. Did you know that? So if you're not in relationship with someone, if you don't love someone, how can you then demonstrate an act of love when you have no relationship of love with a person? You can't do that. That's why people have become highly ineffective. Highly ineffective. Now, when you love someone, when you really love someone, you get down on your, you'll plead, you'll do whatever you can do, and you'll say, listen, Please, you'll be patient, you'll wait, you'll take the time. When you don't love someone and you correct them, as soon as they give you a rebuttal, you get upset and angry and offensive and offended. None of that happens when you truly love someone. Do you know why? Because when you love someone, the number one sense within you is I want this person to live And when I say live, I'm not talking about this world. I'm talking about their soul being absolutely secured in Christ. And you become willing to go the extra mile for that person. And you will wait for as long as necessary to do whatever you can do for that person. And you don't give up on the person either. 
and you do not do the one thing, cut them loose and never speak to them again. No, that's not love either. You see that all throughout the word of God. You do. You see how it's effective. When true love is involved and you see how it's ineffective. When people are just simply trying to dominate somebody else. And because the rule of force is in this world now, you've got to be careful lest you find yourself working by that rule of force. And that's what the Antichrist lives by. That's what he edifies. Anyway, back to a nation. So we had this conversation about the nation, and it reminded me of Hosea. You guys ever read Hosea? You guys ever read that? Very interesting. Uh, it's a very, it is full of information, right? But let me read this to you. Set the trumpet to my mouth. He shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. Israel shall cry unto me, my God, we know thee. Israel hath cast off the thing that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. They have set up kings, but not by me. They have made princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off. Thy calf, O Samaria, hath cast thee off. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will I, how long will it be ere they attain to innocent, innocent, Innocency, that's what it says, innocency. Listen, for from Israel was it also the workmen made it. Therefore, it is not, it is not God, but the calf of Samaria shall be broken into pieces. For they have sown the wind. They shall reap the whirlwind. They sowed unto humanity humanity's stuff, and they're going to reap a whirlwind, which is destruction. That's what comes from humanity's or flesh stuff. They didn't sow unto God. So what is he talking about here? What is he? He said, they have set up kings, but not by me. They have made themselves princes, and I knew it not. Of their silver and gold have they made them idols, that they may be cut off, that they may be cut off, he said. He says, thy camp, O Samaria, hath Cast thee off, mine anger is kindled against thee. Against who? Because of the calf, you, Samaria. Mine anger is kindled against them. How long will it be, error, I supposed to be error, they attain to innocency? So how long will they walk in these this, this crooked way and attain their status of innocence again? Or think of themselves innocent. Oh, that sounds familiar. How long can a person walk in error and yet claim themselves to be innocent? Oh, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Let me keep reading. It says, for from Israel was it also. Same thing in Samaria. Same thing happened in Israel. The workmen made it. The workmen made it. Now, we're talking about Israel. Therefore, it is not God. But the calf of Samaria shall be broken into pieces. For they have sown the wind, and they shall reap the whirlwind. They, their efforts went into nothingness. It went into nothing eternal. To sow to the wind is to put all your energy into things that are not eternal, that have nothing to do with the kingdom of the living God. Like, all, like, a, like a weapons expert. It's going to end up being nothing. Think about it. Hmm? Like a soldier. The fighting men of this world, that's only good for this world. Not for the kingdom. See, there are things that are profitable in this world that will not translate into eternity. They won't. They've sown to the wind. They shall reap the whirlwind. It hath no stalk. The bud shall yield no meal. If so, it be it yield. 
the strangers shall swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now shall they be among the Gentiles as a vessel wherein is no pleasure. So the appointed people will be among those who are not appointed as nothing. No status in the world whatsoever. For they have gone up to Assyria. A wild ass alone by himself, Ephraim, hath hired lovers. Yea, though they have hired among the nations, now will I gather them. And they shall sorrow a little for the burden of the kings and princes. Because Ephraim hath made many altars to sin. Altars shall be unto him a sin. An altar. What's an altar for? What is an altar for? Wasn't an altar for a sacrifice? Yes. Wasn't a sacrifice to gain an audience for the sake of the people? Yes. Yes. Let me continue. I have written to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. They sacrificed flesh for the sacrifices of mine offerings and eat it. But the Lord accepteth them not. Now will he remember their iniquity and visit their sins. They shall return to Egypt as bondage. Did you hear what he said? Here's how good God is. Here's how awesome he is. He said, they sacrifice flesh for the sacrifices of fine offerings and eat it. But the Lord accepteth them not. He's not accepting their sacrifices. But listen to what he says. He says, now will he remember their iniquity? Number one, but what does he say? He says, and will visit their sins. He's going to visit their sins. He didn't say he was going to visit them. He said he was going to visit their sins. Do you not know that this same thing is all throughout the word of God? When God says he's going to visit and and start, you know, doing away with people, he's visiting their iniquity, not their righteousness, their iniquity. Not their everlasting deeds, not their commitment to him, but their sin, their iniquity, their brutality, bestiality, you name it. He's visiting the darkness upon the world. Do you hear me? When God comes, he will visit the darkness in this world. His visit, right? Because God set that standard in the beginning. He did. What did God clearly say? What did he clearly say? He tells you what his visitation is. This is the King James Version. Somebody says, mine says, punish. Visit when God visits, right? This is his earth. So when he visits... When he does, because he said no one wants him to visit them. In your time of visitation, he says, when I come looking. See, God, when he looks upon something, listen to me. When he looks upon something, he destroys iniquity. You do understand that, right? When God looks upon something, he destroys iniquity. So if he visits and looks, iniquity is destroyed. If a person has become iniquitous, Aren't they destroyed? If their identity is bound within their iniquity and sin, they're destroyed. There's nothing of them left. When you're saved by the Lord Jesus Christ and you start stepping out in faith and you begin to grow in his goodness, you still have sinful things in your life. But when the Lord comes, he will deliver those who are saved from their iniquity. How does that happen? Because he will destroy that iniquity and it is no longer a burden upon those who are saved. See, once you're saved, your identity is bound within Christ. Those who are truly saved are trying to get away from every sin they do. They're trying to straighten up their lives. When God comes back and looks upon us, he'll destroy darkness for the brightness of his coming, will he not? When he looks upon us, he will destroy iniquity. But your identity is not within iniquity. Your identity is bound within Christ. And you're trying to get away from iniquity. So then when he comes, 
he will have accomplished the absolute deliverance in your life for those who believe in Christ. But what if you're of the world? What if you love the world? Then you're going to be on this earth, and he's the last thing you're going to want to see. That's why they go hide. They don't want to get away from their sin. They take joy in their sin. They take pleasure in sin. And when he comes back, he's going to destroy that. They will be destroyed with it. Now do you see how that works? To you, it's full deliverance. To them, it's absolute judgment. Do you hear me? It is the destruction of the world they built. Why do you think in the Bible it says healing is coming with them? Deliverance is coming with them. Everything you need is coming with them. Huh? And you will be utterly delivered. That's why he is the author and finisher of your faith. That's why he will deliver you. You don't deliver yourselves. Man will not deliver you. He will deliver you. That's why in the Bible it says, when you see all these things begin to come to pass, lift up your head, look up and lift up your head, because your redemption draweth nigh. Your full redemption cannot be complete without the Lord. And the Godhead is right here on this earth. When he comes back, darkness is going to be bound up, wrapped up, totally destroyed. All those who have a relationship bound within Christ will be set free from everything. Everything. No more bondage. And because you have an advocate with the Father who is Christ, you are indeed free. That's why we strive now. That's why we strive now. Do you know how many people are just losing hope? They don't understand the process. They don't understand what's about to happen. They don't. All they think about are one or two things, right? They're going to be a Rambo for Jesus in the end times. You know, operating like Rambo, that's a figment of someone's imagination. Or they're giving up all the way and they're saying, what's the use? What's the use? I can't do this and can't do that, can't do that. Keep striving. The word says, run, but don't faint. The word says, he that endures until the end, the same shall be saved. Now, if you endure something, that means you're putting up with something. I'll tell you something. When it's all said and done, you're going to fall to your knees and say, thank you, Lord, for every trouble I ever had in my life. Now I see. Now I see it. Because without Christ, there is no deliverance. You can try and do everything right. You cannot deliver yourselves. There's no way you can have that much knowledge. Nor can your brain hold it. You don't have the right moves. It requires faith. And that what Robin says all the time. Faith is required. He's right. It requires faith. You cannot deliver yourself. But the Lord can, and he is, and this is part of his process, and he will finish what he began in you. The Bible says he will finish the work he began in you. Did you hear me? He'll finish the work he began in you. You know what that means? You did not. You did not go to him on your own. You had to identify him first. And who do you think put that identification of Christ within you? Who do you think put that in your soul to cry out to the living God? It doesn't matter how bad you think you're messing up. Why do you keep going to Christ? Because the identification of Christ is within you. Who do you think put that in you? Your father did, not man. And why did he put that in you? Because you're of the family. That's why you have to get up off your Charlie Brown bed. Stop saying, woe is me, and simply say, thank you, Lord. And you strive, strive, strive. Stop trying to understand the dark storm and realize all storms pass. Stop trying to understand the the weight of the hail that's taken down your situation. Stop doing that and realize this storm will pass. Stop listening to flesh. Nothing of flesh can explain the spiritual truth. You'll not have it. 
You can read every book on the planet, and you can be spiritually blind as a bat. Spiritual wisdom is given by the Holy Spirit. You cannot get that by a book. Listen. Hosea 8, 14, for Israel hath forgotten his maker and built a temple. Judah hath multiplied fenced cities, but I will send a fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. I'm reading this because right here in the USA, we face similar conditions. I mean, people can act like somehow this nation is blessed beyond belief. Well, let me tell you something. When something is blessed beyond belief, God becomes the defense of that place. That means no nefarious activities can be against it. That means the enemy cannot raise up a standard against that place. God will defend it. God will, not man, God will. That's not what's happening, is it? It's as if we're descending into darkness. Now, people can deceive themselves all day and sit there and say, it's going to get better. Watch. All we need is this. They keep saying, all we need is this secret ingredient and everything is going to be okay. That is an illusion. It's not happening. Because I'll say it again. Many people are looking to leaders. Why are those leaders not calling out on the name of Jesus of Nazareth? If I was a leader in this nation and went through half the stuff these folks are going through, they would hear my big mouth saying, Lord Jesus, I need you. That's what I would say. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't say to the people, oh, I have the answer and puff my I wouldn't be doing any of that. I would stand in truth and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. We need you. And then I would ask everybody who stands with me. Oh, we would see something would happen. But you think I would sit there and say, you know, we're going to show them the, all this bluster? No. Because if you love the Lord, you're not going to separate the salvation of your soul, that born-again Christian. You're not going to separate that because people are around you. You're not going to do it. See, that's what, you know what, that's what cost me everything but granted me everything. How about that? Because I wasn't going to do it. There was no way I was going to put Christ in my pocket. For what? No, no. I'm not a secret Christian. That's not what I am. And that there's no such thing as a secret Christian. You know that, don't you? Because the Lord said, if you don't, if you can't confess him, before men, he'll deny you before the angels. And the only reason I altered that, I'm paraphrasing that, because it says if you deny me before men, well, guess what? If you put Christ in your pocket where nobody is quite sure if you're a Christian or not, because you're not professing anything, because you don't have the ways that Jesus said should be in you, right? If you don't have that stuff, then who are you? There's no such thing. And by the way, a Christian does not call him or herself a Christian. That's not how it began. John, Peter, Paul, them, they didn't call themselves Christians. Other people did. And Christian means Christ like. And they say, oh, there goes those, they're just like Christ. Oh, here they, they're just like Christ. There go the ones that are like Christ. That's what the other people said. You don't call yourself a Christian. One cannot testify of himself. Isn't that what the Word teaches? What do you have these days? That's exactly what people do, and they think that's enough. They think it's enough. So they don't speak of Jesus before men. They do it secretly, it seems, only around the little cliques and groups, wrong, right in the face of darkness itself. How can we walk with a duality? That's what it is, and it's dangerous. And that dip... You see, because if they have examples like that, it teaches you the same thing. And then you begin to do it, and you think it's okay. People are suffering. They don't have answers. They don't have supernatural intervention. They're suffering. 
Why are they suffering? Because of what we just read. Because every time a nation mingles, mingles and dilutes its salvation and mingles it with the philosophies of men, they end up denying Christ before men. And when they do this, the Lord already told us what he's going to do. Then he calls that correction. But then you remember when he said to Israel, why should I stricken you anymore? You'll just rebel more and more. Do you remember that? And then all of a sudden they lost Israel. We're at that stage. When a place is stricken, when a place is hit back to back with stuff, you would think they would repent. But that's not what they're doing. See, some places in the USA, some places around the world are being hit hard. Some by volcanoes, some by storms, some by other things. You would think they would say, wait a minute, wait a minute. We are the created, so let us call upon the creator. We need some intervention. We can't handle this. Only pride will make you say, oh, we can handle everything. See, it's a standard in the world that you have pride. When you're a leader, you guys do know that. Pride is being part of a leader. Why do I say that? Because they'll never admit that they can't do anything. They'll never admit that. And they'll take credit for everything. Do you, do you guys hear me? Do you hear what I'm saying? And Christians, those who believe in Christ, are losing themselves in the worship of men. You're not to worship men. You're to intercede for men. Didn't you read the Gospel of John? To as many as believe upon his name has he given power to become sons of God. Angels intercede for man. Just like you intercede for the leaders on this earth. You're children of the king, the creator of all things. You're not some ordinary person out here. Don't attain it so long as you follow the ways of men. Here we just read in Hosea how they follow the ways of Samaria. And so guess what? They received the reward of Samaria, which was what? Destruction. Do you want the, you know, the rewards of this world? I certainly hope you don't. Hmm? You guys don't? Because the Lord has already, he already told us what will be. People don't believe it when it happens. When pe Instead of walking around with long faces because people did not get their way. Because I'm telling you this. America's not some, just some ordinary place. Why do you think the devil is so embedded in this place? Satan is not attracted to a place that is, you know, of no consequence. Satan is attracted to the word of God. Satan would not even be here in this land if the word of God were not in this land. You know there's a war happening right now. And people should consider carefully what side they're on. I mean immediately. There's a separation happening right now and people cannot see. And when the consequences come, no one will escape. In the Bible it says, come out of her, my people, be not partakers of her sins, that you will not partake of her plagues. Don't be fooled by anybody's fancy words, refined speech, coherent topics. Please don't be fooled by that. But know the word of God yourself. Specifically, know the words of Jesus yourself. Pursue that relationship. Everybody who's, I'll tell you, you guys are going to get mad at me on this one. Everybody who's looking for this, for that one person to be president, you're going to get somebody totally different. And it's going to come about in a backbreaking way. I mean, almost immediately. Hope you're prepared. Because nobody wins this time. But the Father's words, they're going to be right in everybody's face. No, this is a time of correction.
parents of a house can only let the kids of a house act like heathens for so long. Because if they continue, they'll lose the whole house. Is so what the parents do is they come back and put a halt to everything. And they implement standards nobody can disobey. And they humble those children by correction in front of one another. And when the new day dawns, all the kids are different. This is your father's earth. And his eviction notice is final. This earth does not belong to mankind. God has given man dominion over the earth for a time. The Father himself is coming back here. This process of finishing it has already begun. And all those who find themselves on the outside will have chosen to be on the outside. All those who experience the embrace of Christ during the worst time in history will be those who follow him right now. Not later, right now. Your decision right now means everything. If you think that people, that you're going to decide when things get their roughest and worst, you're sadly mistaken. That means you have knowledge now and you're choosing not to pursue him with all of what you are. If you do that, you're going to end up just like those in Hosea because you're not pursuing him with the strength God gave you. God gave you a measure of strength. What are you using it for? He gave you a measure of power. What do you use it for? Everything you have is in measure. What are you using it for? Are you pursuing Christ? Because you're expressing your truth right now. Not by your lips. No, by your life. Your life is the truth of you. Not by what you say, by what you've been choosing. That's the truth of you. I'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. What we act on is the truth of us. Can you guys remember that? That's actually, I think I've worn that statement out, really. But it's true. What we act on is the truth of us. So ask yourself something, right? Because with our actions, what we choose to do is our truth. Out of the mouth flows many different issues. But we always end up acting on those things we have chosen by the heart. You guys, you know that, right? You know that. But listen, that's part of the beauty of Christ. Say, for example, a person has gotten it wrong to this very day. This is your day. Your day to consider. Your day to change. I'm telling you right you know, people don't like this, but I'm telling you now with Christ, it does not matter what you did yesterday. It doesn't matter what you did this morning. It matters what you do from this moment on with Christ. See, with Christ in this era of grace and mercy, that, that, that should never be taken for granted. Once you find out and you really consult yourself, think, then yes, what you act on is your truthful choice. In the Bible, when it says faith without works is dead, what that means is there's got to be some action behind what you believe in. And in truth, there is action behind what you believe in. And you've been expressing that all this time, regardless of what you've said, regardless of what you proclaimed. A proclamation is nothing if it cannot be brought to pass, right? A prophecy is nothing if it's not brought to pass. That's why God will always do what? He'll always fulfill his prophecies, always. And with us, 
we act on those things we honestly choose. See, with our mouth, we can really fool some people. We can fool everybody. You can fool everybody some of the time. You can. But your choices, they mean everything. It's not what you say. It's the true intent of your heart. And the true intent of your heart is what you end up acting on. For example, you may, you may have been in school laughing with everybody against a person. But then possibly you saw that person needed something. And your heart leaped and you went to go help the person. The very person you were laughing at, you went to go help. Okay? You could be angry at someone. And by your mouth, you may have said some things. But by way of action, you're going to help that person with everything you can. See, your mouth, out of your mouth, True poison can spew, yes. But your actions, what you've acted on, is the truth of you. That is the truth. In this world we live in today, people believe that what a person say is the truth of that person. No, it isn't. That's why, you know, it's a good rule of thumb. The best people who know you are the people who have been with you. People love to go to a new place. Listen, because I'm telling you what I know, not what I read. People love to go to a new place. When I first entered into the service, I used to love to go to a new place. You know why? It's a brand new start. You get you, get, you start getting in with the wrong people. You trust the wrong person over here. You didn't really know the person. You re- really didn't know that person. You joined something you shouldn't have, this, that, and the other. You go to a new place, and you can start again. It's like going to a new house or something. Suppose you're, you know, the old house is full of horrors. And so you go to a new place and it's brand new. And you say, oh, thank God, it's a new environment. But if your heart has not changed, do you know what you do? You invite the same, if not worse, elements into your new environment. Now your new environment is ruined. I'm telling you what I know. That's why I'm so careful. Regardless of what anybody says, my actions are in check. What we have acted on is what we truly have faith in. Do you know that? What you act upon, that's what you have faith in. How you acted upon something is the truth of you, regardless of what you say. The Lord comes back. What you truly chose is going to be revealed. But you have an opportunity right now, regardless of what you messed up. Change everything. You're not meant, not one of you is meant to go to hell. Do you know that? You're not meant to be locked away from all light and all love and all wisdom and all truth. You're not meant to be locked away from that. You're not meant to be separated from that. You can't survive outside of that. The worst murderer in the world. You know, a lot of people, they look at people that have, You know, possibly they did something and they just tossed that person in the garbage can. I don't do that. Again, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I'm the worst person I know, so I'm not tossing anybody away. I believe in salvation. What about you guys? That means I believe in Christ. There is no salvation without Christ. And so I truly believe in Christ. I also believe in forgiveness. There is no salvation without forgiveness. I ask you something. How can we accept that the Lord would wipe away everything we did, yet we're not willing to do the same for somebody else? Why do we always say, well, that person didn't change? Why are we so willing to condemn others? But we claim salvation for ourselves. See, I'm not that way. That's hypocrisy. I'm no different than the worst person in the world. And truth be told, if a person is doing wicked things in the earth, are they not deceived? And if they're deceived, they're captured by the enemy. Who's going to help free that person? See, I don't know about you. I believe in the work of Christ. There are people out there right now who are mixed up in some bad things. They're making the wrong choices. They are fully deceived by the enemy. It's going to go to them. 
See, you have to eat dirt. Some you got to crawl in the dirt. You got to get dirty to get to those people. You can act like you've never had a doo-doo stain because you have. Those people will die. They will perish if someone is not sent to them. God can do it himself, but he chose to work through us. He chose to work through those who would believe him, to those who underwent the transition, to those who endure the process. He works through you. Even the political mess, they can't fix. The, how can they fix that? They can't fix anything. They're duped by Satan himself. There's no escape from that. It takes somebody just like one of you to introduce the standards of Christ, to demonstrate that by way of your life your decisions, your actions to demonstrate his truth. How do you demonstrate the truth of Christ? That's when you're patient with the person who hates you. That's when you love someone. When you love your enemy, you're demonstrating Christ. That person who is your enemy will not be your enemy for long. You see, I found that out. People are only your enemy because they don't know you. Do you know that? If a person accuses you of something, say they falsely accuse you, Jimmy Crack Corn, so what? It's because they don't know you. If somebody came to me and said, you know, Mike is really a mean person, that person doesn't know me. You remember all the people that said, hey, he's going to have you locked up. He's going to do this. He's going to do that. He's going to do this and that. And what did I tell you guys? Time proves all things. Poor Angela, they had Angela scared to death. They did. They had, you, you listen, they're supposed to be God-fearing people. God-fearing people lied to her straight to her face. You know what I told Angela? Don't do anything back to any of them. Time proves all things. But see, I'm very patient. I believe in the Lord's way. And even with Angela, you know what I did? Nothing. 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 Why? To demonstrate the Lord's way. To be who I am. Decency. Respect. And do you know why? Because you ever meet a person that other people just loved to hurt? Huh? You ever meet a person that's They're so compassionate, they can't see the dangers before them. That's how people were. And somehow I already knew that. I knew that. So when you're dealing with anybody like that, what's the first thing you demonstrate? Trust. That takes years, not weeks. Trust. The truth. No indecent things. None of that nonsense. I don't like that nonsense. But that's all that came from looking out for the other person is what I'm telling you. When you care for people, you're not going to do anything to put them in harm's way. You're not going to do anything to take advantage of them. You're not going to do anything like that. You're going to wait for as long as necessary so that person can be whole. Because, see, when you love someone, you want them complete correct? You want them to make it. You want them to succeed, to go all the way. Too many Christians are so quick to look for enemies. That's replication of what the world is doing. That's what these dark kingdoms in history did. They always had an enemy. Listen to me. Satan will always have you have an enemy. Your father in heaven will never tell you to go and find an enemy. To go and find a target. No, the Lord will never tell you that. But the devil will. That's what Satan does. Satan will have you go against anybody he can. And if your actions lead you to do that, you will have consequences. 
This is why people have these broken, messed up lives, that they can't get out of this circle of destruction. person like me, I really care about people. I don't want to see anybody in that circle of destruction. I know what that circle is. People can deny it all day, but the truth is they don't have a breakthrough. They know they have that emptiness. They want something more, but they keep living the same exact way. They keep, for some reason, we think we have the answer, don't we? Don't we? You know what I found out in life? It is so easy to say, you know what? I don't have the I don't have the answer. I don't know what I'm doing. Lord, please lead me. And when you do that, He will put you on a path where there's you're you're not going to be incomplete. You're going to be in the know in the know, not just in the know, but in the know in the know. He will teach you, guide you, demonstrate you, utilize you. You'll be blessed beyond measure. Because you'll be full. Being blessed is not always tangible. I would rather have a word for someone than to have a bank account with 500 bucks in it for security or something like that. I would rather have a word. I would rather have something useful for someone. So this is your day. This is your day. Remember something. What you act upon. That's your truth. That is your truth. Because when you act upon something, when you pursue something, you're doing so by the heart. You're giving an answer to the many questions. And I want you guys to think about something before I hop to another subject. Satan fell in the beginning, right? He did. He fell in the beginning. So God has a brand new family in the making, correct? A brand new family. Hear me. He has a brand new family in the making. This, how do you test a person to see if they're going to fall in the future? How do you do that? How would God see if we're going to end up like Satan? How would he see that? What method would he use? Has anybody ever heard my explanation? And it is mine, but I'm the only one I know of that ever said it because I'm, a, I'm, I'm crazy like that, but, but. How would God ever determine if his children are true thoroughly enough that he would allow them to step foot in the kingdom and really trust them? How would he do that? There's a method. There is a method. See, Satan fell when he perceived himself and he began to compare himself with the living God and sought to ascend his throne above the throne of God as though he was saying, you know, the living God doesn't know what he's doing. My way is better. Instantly he had pride. Many people do that today. So how would God ever try us? How would he try us to be his true children? You know what is true? Listen to me carefully. If you were to develop a relationship with someone on a very deep level, right? With anyone on a very deep level. Say you talked to a person. Listen to me. You talked to a person for years but you never touched each other but you talked to a person for years no one needs to see none of that you just talked to them and you really got to know the other person and you really liked the other person then all of a sudden you you listen you're faithful to the person and you have never seen the person before but you're faithful then you trust the other person but you never saw this person before and this person has never demonstrated to you anything but you trust the other person. And this person has never proven anything to you, but you trust that person. Do you know what would happen if the two people meet and it turns out that that person is everything you dreamed of and more? Do you know what would happen? There is no force anywhere that can cause you to betray the other person. Why? Because if you're faithful without having anything proven, without getting anything in return, Without having any, you, you don't sense any, any, anything from that individual, right? But you trust that person and it's based on a relationship of a very deep level called the soul and you become faithful by way of your soul. Then when you meet, meet, the relationship is already established. The loyalty is already established. 
And when it turns out that this person is much more than you ever suspected, there is no force on earth that can cause you to betray that person. Because when you do meet when things are proven, it's over. There is no force that can cause the separation. When you have a relationship that is based on a very deep level, the shallow things can never interfere. They can't. You're believing in a God you have not seen. You're trusting in Christ, who you did not sit down and have lunch with. You didn't. We're doing all things by faith, but we're becoming faithful in those things that we do by faith. We started out saying, oh, yes, I want to get to heaven and get out of here. But then as we continue to go through this process, we begin to see the importance of what the word stands for, what the word is. We start to adore something we never, ever touched before. We don't feel its instant power. We don't get all that from it. What we're doing, we're doing by faith. And we're becoming loyal by faith without seeing. What do you think is going to happen when you see and you've been loyal by faith? I'll tell you what's going to happen. You'll never betray anything in the kingdom. Never. You'll never betray it. Nothing can make you separate from it. Nothing. Not that any power would hold you there but you would be totally faithful to it. Why? Because you've been faithful to it without the perks. Do you hear me? You've been, when you're faithful to something without reward, what do you think is going to happen when the reward comes? Nothing will have power to separate you from it. You will have found it true. If the reward comes first, let me tell you what happens when people meet people in the flesh. They're talking... They may talk to each other for a long time, but they're not hearing anything the other person is saying. Let me tell you what really happens. You see another person in the flesh, and your flesh activates. And your flesh says, oh, we got to do everything we can not to let that one get away. Because you have the sensations and all that stuff, right? And so what you really do is you end up devising a plan to keep the other person. Listen to me carefully. You devise a plan to keep the other person. Then, if you're one of those heartfelt persons, or you think you are, you start to fall in love with a vision of the person. Not the person in front of you, but what the person could be down the road. And then you try to start, you start making this person somebody else. And then after five or six years... When you can't make that person any other person than what they are, you say, well, you're not turning out to be what I thought you were. Goodbye. Why? Because what you did was you met someone. You had a vision with that person. You didn't even know the person, but you fell in love with the vision. You said you loved them. You didn't even see them. You saw the vision. You fell in love with the vision. And when the vision did not happen, you were heartbroken, not because of them, but because of the vision. And because you can't have it, you say goodbye. That's what happens. You say bye-bye. It's not what I thought it was. Of course it isn't. Because you never gave the person a chance. You didn't love the person for who they were. You loved the person for who they could be. I see that all throughout the earth. And you could tell a person that. But they would have no understanding of it. But if the totality of your relationship is based and something so much deeper, then guess what? When age comes and gravity works and everything hits the ground, you still love the person because you don't love them for the shell. You don't love them for the, all that attractiveness and everything else. You have found something genuine. You saw the real person beyond the flesh. And age cannot take that away. Do you hear me? When you find the person and you love the person beyond the flesh, nothing can take the love away. See, that's when you start to know a person for who they are. You're not duped by the skin suit. Young people, you will get older. 
gravity will still keep working, and one day everything will hit the floor, and nothing will get off that floor again, and then what you're going to do then? When you start thinking of that, you can reevaluate what you're doing in the first place. You can start to see, well, yes, you know, that's why God made us young, right? God made you for somebody else. That initial attraction, right, is, is, is necessary most often. But in this day and age, people have taken that too far. That's all they see. They cannot go beyond that. Why do you think people are trying to make themselves look like the most prettiest person that they think is pretty? That is so incredibly foolish. People don't even know that God perfected them at the beginning. I have a habit of telling people all the time, you look better natural. I can appreciate what God made, not the improvements man makes, not what man thinks. Some people look silly. They just look outright silly, but they don't know they look silly. When you can see the beauty of the truth, that's when you stop changing things. But more and more people want to look like that mannequin, the J.C. Penny mannequin. You know, I said that when I was, I said that a long time ago. I really honestly said that. I suspected people are going to try and look just like plastic mannequins, and that's exactly what they look like, plastic mannequins. And it's so unfortunate because God never made a mistake in how he made anybody. He didn't. He did not. Okay, last thing on that subject. Do you not know, if you guys picked out the prettiest person on earth, but that person was ugly inside, do you not know I could not see any beauty on that person? That person would make me almost want to vomit. There is no beauty when the heart is dark. But you can pick the worst person out in the world. I'm telling you now, if the inside of that person is beautiful, to me, that person's going to look so clean, incredibly clean. That makes a difference with me. Once the Lord opens your eyes to what's on the inside, the outside will no longer fool you ever again. People live by a standard of vanity, not by a standard of truth. God never made a mistake. Nothing needs improvements. It's just that people do not appreciate the vast diversity of what the Lord has already accomplished. Not to mention, you guys remember I said, what if there were no mirrors? Everybody would feel better. Because a mirror makes you want to look like somebody else for the sake of somebody else. Think about that. That makes everybody unoriginal. That makes everybody like parakeets copycats, whatever you want to call them. But the standard is by the eye. How can a Christian live by a standard of the eye and say they walk in the spirit? But everything we do is a vanity, a vain thing. What is wrong? What is wrong with us? I hope that we get all this corrected because it weighs on the mind. You know what happens if something stays in your mind too long, right? It trickles down into the heart. The mind is a gateway to the heart. And once it's in the heart, guess what you do? You begin to live by it. It all begins at the table of your mind. What you accept there, what you keep there, trickles into the heart. What's in the heart, once it builds up, comes right out of your mouth. It also becomes choices you make in the earth. That's why the Lord said, take captive your thoughts. You are to take captive your thoughts. Somebody is sitting at your table of the mind all the time. All the time. Lord, help us. All right. Now, before I go, before I go, we're not going to discuss the Trump thing, yep, you guys keep your ear open towards that, okay? I'm going to be preoccupied with overseas things tonight. I will be. Um, yeah, I will be. You guys know we're very close to a breakout on several fronts. Uh, and we have a quick breakdown with a couple of countries that are 
someone off the radar, right? I will have a discussion with you guys about Iceland and why I, I deem it so important. We will have our discussion on Jupiter. We will. You're going to get these. I'm going to make, and today, we started that conversation of Iceland in the chat room. I'm going to make that part of the KD files, but we're also going to have a weekend uh, uh, topic about that, too. Okay? We're going to talk about that because this really affects you. And um, I had to be gentle with it, but I'm going to be forthcoming, very forthcoming. I will tell you this. One of the dangers of Iceland is because it can cause a major collapse when all the plates shift. And what that means is due to these erup listen to me, due to these eruptions, you're not years away. You're not months away. That's why we have to discuss this subject soberly, very soberly. I know people thought it was crazy when the first eruption happened and I said it's not going to stop. And they said I didn't know what I was talking about. And then it erupted again, and I said it's not going to stop. And they called me crazy again. It's not that I know everything. That's not what the deal is, right? Listen, you, you guys can know the same things I know. Add a couple cues in life. I've been to Iceland a few times. But most importantly, the Lord showed me that place. The Lord showed me what was unleashed because of that place. Just like he showed me the stone steps. Somebody asked me, did Trump get arrested? I'll tell you something about the stone steps. When they escorted this person down the stone steps, notice the language, escorted. Notice the consistent language, escorted. I, out of my mouth, said escorted. Remember that. When they escorted this person down the stone steps, the people were heavily divided. Heavily divided. Do you hear me? Heavily divided. And shortly after that, should that take, if that was to take place in our time, it's what comes after. It's what comes after. That requires a topic all by itself. People are not conforming to a higher level of seeing things. People are stuck in their own ways, and something is feeding the violence in the people. That number of 20 million dead, dead, that comes from within the USA, not outside, inside the USA. And that happens all at one time. We'll discuss that too. I've always said we'll discuss more should we see that, right? Should we see it? I said I'd discuss more. That's exactly what I meant. Because if I discussed it prior to that activity, you guys would never listen to me again. You'd be too offended. Because of offense, there are several subjects I cannot discuss with anybody. I just can't discuss them yet. After these certain markers passed, then the offense won't be there. And then people are more prone to hear. I tried to tell something prior to a marker, and people were so offended. So the Lord was right in the first place. I can't talk about certain things because people get too offended. That just simply means you may be emotionally vested in something. And so when a marker passes or an event passes, it eases your emotional attachment so that you can hear, you know, other things. It's just like, if you were to go to a person with the word of the Lord because you believe they need to hear it, you can't make that timing by yourself. You must go by the Lord's timing. Because if you sit there and wait six hours, talk to a person who never heard a word you said, and they get angry at you and will never hear you again, you did nothing. They didn't hear your conversation. They blocked you out. And now you can't talk to them at all because you offended them. When you're dealing with, with any in any situation where a person can be offended, you have to be very patient and trust the Lord's guidance. Right? Like the Russians. Like the Russians. And if you notice, you know, people want things to hurry up and happen. That's not the way it works. That's just not the way it works. 
has given us ample time to prepare. So we have to take advantage of every single day he gives us. That is not, you know, utter destructive, right? We have to take advantage of that. But I, I, I leave you with this warning, folks. Please be careful not to follow the direction of the world. Please don't follow the direction of the world. Please don't do that. If you're in a nation and your nation is hating another nation, don't become a part of that hatred. Please don't become a part of that. You're nearing a time where your choices, your choices can become finite. And you won't be able to reverse them. You're living in that time now. Planetary impact comes. Collision. There will be a collision. You'll see it. There's a spiritual principle. We'll have a small window to discuss. But during that time, a lot of the world is going to be duped already. All these things will happen so quickly in a compressed amount of time. The best way to be prepared is to really reevaluate your position now. Remember something. What you're choosing is the action you're taking. And I hope that your actions do not align with the world. I pray they do not. Folks, I'm going to see you next time right here at COT. God bless each of you. I've got some writing to do, and I've got some monitoring to do, and we'll go over lots of topics. <sighs> lots. Remember, the KD Files First Prince will be up this weekend. Remember that. They'll be up like, uh, what do I say, Sunday night or something like that? It'll be Saturday or Sunday night probably. But they'll be up there sometime this week. And the first, one of the first prints in their introduction, one of them is like a story that gets you used to everything else. And from there, you, you'll be, you can choose different areas. All right. There'll be, you know, content will be placed up there. Not all at once, piece by piece. I have to do that in a very obedient way. Since we're bound to go through a bunch of stuff, I hope that they're really helpful to you because we're going to begin to discuss true preparations. Tonight, we only discussed one of the... Well, if, if you can't do what we said tonight, there's no need to prepare for anything else. See, because if a person is not secure in Christ, any preparation they make is just simply for their own death. And I mean eternal death, which means you don't die, but you will be tormented. So the first step in your preparations is a reevaluation of what you've been following in truth. To really look inside of yourselves and begin to purge. Ask the Lord in truth. Realize he is your savior. Realize this is a brand new start. Take full advantage of this brand new start. Full advantage of it. No matter what you did prior to this. Take full advantage Trust in the ways of the Lord. Seek to be obedient, which is to trust his way. Some of you don't know if you can trust it because you have not stepped out in faith that you would trust it. Once you step out in faith, the Lord will not fail to fulfill things. Once they are fulfilled, you'll be an experiencer of his goodness and his deliverance. Once you experience his goodness and deliverance, that's when your faith goes up more than a few notches. That's when the devil can come and say, well, you might not be delivered, and you'll say to any voice that just rang in your mind, get behind me, Satan. My Lord will deliver me, and he has already delivered me before. And you'll start thanking the Lord, possibly go into a fit, do whatever you do, but Satan will not be able to shake your faith. But you have to be, you have to experience God's deliverance. You have to experience the Lord's resolve in your life. And the only way that's going to happen is if you step out on faith. Worry about your trials, troubles, and tribulations. Don't worry about that. 
You can't have those unless Christ is managing those things over your life. And by the way, they're not meant to, they're not going to hurt you. They're going to build you up. They may seem like they're hurting you, but they're not. They may seem like they're stealing from you, but they're not. They may seem like you're losing things in it, but you're not losing a thing. Do you hear me? Not one who believes in Christ has lost anything in truth. You cannot lose what belongs to you. Remember that. You cannot lose what belongs to you. You cannot. My Lord, these are times of great sobriety. Not show business, but sobriety and demonstration. And if you're alive right now, well, guess what? You made it into that era. I just pray you're on the right side. See, everybody's going to get demonstration. But each person is going to determine who they get that demonstration from. For those of you who believe in Christ, I pray that you receive that demonstration from Christ because you decided to step forward in faith. That takes an instant trust without knowing. That's all. Determine yourselves. Listen, be real about what you believe in. If you believe, then say, hey, I'm going to take this step by faith. I don't know what's going to happen. But I believe in the Lord. That's why I'm walking forward in faith. When you do that, when you have that solid reason, then nothing can come into your mind to make you back down. Hmm? Somebody says, what step, that step you take when you've been trying to wait for a specific time, closer to the time of doom before you do anything, stop doing that. Don't do that. Don't don't say to yourselves, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait just in case, you know, nothing happens. I don't want to, you know, make a show of things too big before the time. No, don't do that. Don't just step by faith. You don't have to do anything radical. Do something true. Very true. Hmm? How about this one for starters? You know that problem that you had? How about you cast that burden upon the Lord by faith and stop carrying that burden with you that it would affect how you interact with everybody else? And when certain people come around and causes you to act a different way, how about you cast that care upon Christ so you can be consistent around everybody? How about not letting the enemy move you and cause you to target other people or suspect other people because of that trouble? How about you cast that upon the Lord first? And let him deal with it. Because you can't deal with it. You have no power to change it. It's not yours. So then give it to the Lord and entrust him fully. Say, Lord, you have it. I don't know what to do with it. But you have it now. I will not carry it. If you give it to the Lord, then you've got to refuse to carry that burden yourself. You've got to refuse to do it. You can't give it to the Lord and so walk around with your head hung down thinking about it. If you give it to the Lord, refuse to think about it. How do you do that? Because if you have no power to change it, it's not yours in the first place. Why would you have let your head hang low over something you cannot change? That's called a heavy burden. A heavy burden is only heavy because you can't do anything about it. That's when you cast that care upon the Lord. You don't carry that. Don't let it affect your relationship with everybody else, how you interact with everybody else, how you eat, drink, sleep, or do anything. Refuse it. Refuse it. Give it to Christ and refuse it. What you have a responsibility over is what God has empowered you with. If you have power to change something right now, then change it. But if you have no power, it is not yours to carry. Remember that. And I'll see you guys tomorrow right here, COT. God bless all of you. You guys take care of one another.